my family came from communist Poland, you know, effectively had to escape at a certain time. And Poland, frankly, was pretty light communism, if you can say that, compared to China or the Soviet Union in a lot of ways. I knew what happened to my family members, you know, both on the Soviet side and on the Nazi German side. I, I was aware of these stories. But I was growing up in a free society, and it was only after I really started working with people who had suffered at the hands of the Chinese regime that it all clicked. I got, oh, okay, I understand. But I, you know, you don't, you, it's just very hard to imagine. I mean, I think we must live in the freest society in history, yeah. probably, yeah. right? And it's just kind of hard to imagine what it would be like to live in a society where you're always looking over your shoulder. Yeah. Well, frankly, a lot of us are starting to, I think a lot of people are starting to realize what That's it's right. like. Yeah. But, and uh, I think it's no coincidence that the freest society in history also happens to be one of the most um, successful by material metrics, at least. But I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that the, the freedom granted to explore spirituality, religious communities, I think that's crucial in an open democratic society, and it's why it remains protected. And if you think about it, why is that so important? Mm. In a communist society, materialism is a doctrine, going back to the idea of there's no such thing as truth and it's all relative, and that you and your values and your morals are all a product of society and circumstance, and therefore, if I can define that circumstance, I can define morality. That is materialism, yeah? And communism is built on the materialist doctrine. Now, that's why a totalitarian state despises any community, in particular communities, but also individuals, that believe that a moral hierarchy can exist outside of the state. A totalitarian state wants to be the beginning and the end of morality. If you have a moral hierarchy that is independent of that state, it means you have your own moral compass. And it means that there will be some red lines for you because you have a, let's put it in a religious context, it doesn't have to be formal religion, it could be spirituality, it could be Buddhism, it doesn't have to be like a strict fundamentalist thing, right? Let's just call it a, a, a spiritual belief, right? Now, if you have a sovereign relationship with your higher power, your, your, your spiritual relationship. That's a sovereign relationship in religious terms with God, right? That means that there are elements of your morality and view on life that are outside of the state's control, which means they can't shape those elements in terms of morality. That means they can't shape your reality. You have an independent source for how you view the world. That's why totalitarian states like China hate religious communities so much. You know, Uyghur genocide, it threatens them. Tibetans, Christians in China, it threatens them. It's why communism and the phrase that religion is the opium of the masses, they've declared war on having this moral hierarchy, with all of its flaws, by the way, yeah? I'm not saying it's a good, you know, there's flaws there too. But, in principle, they don't, they feel threatened by that idea that you could exist outside of the state with your own morality. Because, that, because they believe that actually only the materialist doctrine defines morality, and that's the state that gets to choose uh, what that reality should be. And so in that context, back to America, where you've got this open democratic society with the separation of powers and the written constitution, it's no co coincidence for me that during the COVID mandates, where we, for the first time in history, we began seeing that abuse of our civil liberties in that orchestrated and global way, um, that a lot of the religious communities were among the first and foremost to oppose those mandates because they immediately saw the dangers of the state dictating in those areas where they already had a sovereign relationship with their spiritual uh, or God or their spiritual uh, uh, being. And whether that's the pastor that was repeatedly arrested in Canada, whether it was the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Muslim communities in the mosques in the UK who were uh, 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 the least compliant when you looked at the surveys when it came to among the lower end of the compliance to COVID mandates was on the Muslim side. The trust was stronger with their imams and their priests and their, and their sense of a moral hierarchy that didn't need the state to validate it. Those that didn't have that, a void and a vacuum is filled by the state and the state steps in where religion used to be. And it's why if you think about the opposition to the USSR in history, if you think about the role religion played in that, yeah, in particular the church, you start seeing some of this, right? And that's why I think that when, when you see in open and, democrat, open and democratic societies with all their imperfections, it's why religious pluralism is a strength. It's for this reason, right? It's why 
religious diversity is a strength because if you, the more diversity you have in doctrine and spirituality and culture, the harder it is for the state to monopolize. And the harder it is for the state to monopolize, the harder it is for the state to become authoritarian. And that's the unique thing that you have in the United States of America because of the separation of powers. They can't get a grip on that diversity and it's a strength. Fascinating. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash free trial yan. That's ept.ms slash free trial j-a-n. I've been thinking about, people have called it a public-private partnership, kind of, you know, collaboration of the state or, you know, agencies uh, that, you know, health agencies, and then also, you know, big tech. And pharmaceuticals. And pharma, and, and big pharma yeah. to, to push, you know, particular narratives, which you mentioned, you know, ultimately didn't make a lot of sense or certainly weren't based on actual science. They're based on the science, yeah. which is yeah. something different entirely. Yeah. How does this fit into your picture here that you're, that you're drawing? Yeah. So back to the idea that the state <clears throat> would seek to um, define your, your morality, it requires an array of tools to do that. When you look at fascism, as opposed to uh, communism, the distinction, so, so the communists would want to seize the means of production and have the state own all of them. Fascism is that partnership you spoke of. It's the, so a better word for fascism is actually corporatism. It's the merger of state and corporate power. But rather than the state seizing the means of production, it begins a partnership with corporates for the purposes of profit. And that's what we began witnessing happening under the COVID period. Uh, Huge, powerful, some of the wealthiest companies on the planet, big tech companies, big pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, right? If you were to look up who paid the largest criminal fine in history, the results that pop up is Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline, two big pharmaceuticals. The assumption that these companies, and Violation Tracker, you can go to as a website, it lists all of the fines, like fraud and all of this stuff that they've had to pay, huge fines, huge, largest you know, fines that you find. The assumption that these companies exist for your benefit is one that really must be interrogated. They exist for profit and you are the product. They are, you are the thing that needs to be exploited for the purposes of profit. So when the state began a partnership with these corporates, I took the view that during the COVID mandate period in particular, our states, whether it's here in the US, in the United Kingdom, <clears throat> were no longer serving their people, but rather they were serving vested interests for the purposes of maximizing profit. That's fascism. That's what Mussolini did. Um, and it's how you utilize industry for the purposes of maximizing profit to deliver a certain goal. And, and in that process, people are simply cogs in the wheel. The individual no longer matters. And it's incredibly, uh, incredibly dangerous. Um, and again, if you don't have that mm, spiritual grounding, then there's a void and that void is filled by the state, and your morality then gets defined by the state. And you have no <clears throat> psychological ability to oppose the purpose the state is saying you exist for, which is as a commodity to maximize profit. Because there's nothing outside of that purpose that the state has set for you that you aspire to. It's why it's so important to have that higher aspiration that exists outside of the context of the state. But in, in, in a short answer to your question, that is fascism. And it's what I believe we, came, we, we became perilously close to, unfortunately.